Most of the questions about data in APCSP really just come down to critical thinking and a little bit of reasoning, uh, and oftentimes just common sense. There's not a whole lot of stuff that you have to remember as, a, as conceptual knowledge. We'll see some examples here and we'll see how that plays out. This here is a pretty good example of a fairly simple question about data. We have here a table that has a whole bunch of data. Now most of this data we're actually not going to need to care too much about. In fact, if you look at the question statement here, it says the store employee wants to calculate the total amount of money that the store will receive if they sell all of their available science fiction books, right? So very clearly it's trying to look for which columns we can ignore. In a way, this is a question about filtering. Basically what we care about is that it's in science fiction and we care about the quantity and we care about the selling price because we want to say how much money we made. So we would look at just books in science fiction and then we would basically multiply the quantity by selling price for each one and do that for all the books in science fiction. Now we don't actually need to care about how any of that works or what a program that does that would look like. All we really need to care about is the fact that we only care about three columns here. We care about selling price, genre, and quantity available. That means we don't actually care about either of these two columns, title and author. Those might be important for some other stuff, but for this particular purpose, we don't actually care about either. Here's another program about interpreting data, but this one is very specifically about data consistency, and specifically it touches on cleaning data, which is the concept that data can be inconsistent or different across different data sets. So here we have some pollution data, and it's about, it, it contains data from 3,000 counties across the United States, right? So what's asking here is you want to combine all of this data and it's asking what are some of the challenges in doing this and combining this data. So if you recall, the main challenges from working across different data sets is that the information can be inconsistent, the information needs to be cleaned, or the information may need to be filtered in some kind of way. In this case, very clearly, it means that the information would need to be consistent across these data sets. So one example of this, we're talking about pollution data, and it doesn't really tell you what the data looks like, but you could assume that maybe in one county, we might measure something like in 10 tons of pollution. Whereas in another county, it might be in kilograms. Be wary of answers that mark difficulties in computing. Of course, you can combine data on different files. That's kind of something we've done a lot. Number of counties being too large for program to process, or that there's too many rows of data. Remember that we can always parallelize data processing to make it more efficient. Really, the only answer here is that the countries or the counties may organize data in different ways. Here's another question about data consistency. Here we have two different data sets. Notice that these tables have different formats in a lot of ways. For example, this up top one here has zip code, uh, but the bottom one does not have zip code, whereas this bottom one has student ID and the top one does not. On the other hand, notice that they both do have some things like days absent. They both do have that. So this question is asking, if you combine the data sets, what can you find in common? What can you do with a combined data set? So both of these do have last name. So you could create a single list of students by name, sorted by last name. They have the last name and they also have the first name right here. So you can do that. So this is something you can do. They also, as we mentioned, have days absent. So we could find what the average number of days absent are between the two charts. So we already found two things that we can do here, which is what we want, we have two answers here. But be wary that we cannot do this because we do not have zip code in the bottom table. And we also cannot do things by student ID because we don't have the student IDs in the top table. We only have their names. Note that there's no fixed strategy for this type of problem. And these are actually very common types of problems. These are, you just kind of got to do a little bit of detective work here, just some critical thinking and some problem solving. What we see here is probably the most common format for questions about data in the APCSP exams. This is very common, it's just like the question we just looked at, but instead of having a chart with actual table and data, they actually just kind of describe what the data is. This one here shows a large data set containing information about all students majoring in computer science in colleges across the United States. Now notice that this last part is pretty important. Specifically, make sure that you account for the fact that these are all students majoring in computer science and it's in colleges across the United States. We also have this information. We have the gender of the student, the state in which they attend college, and their grade point average, and their grade point average on a 4.0 scale. Now notice that we might not need all of this information. What this is then asking is which of these pieces of information can we get only, and this is very important, only using this data set. Now let's start with A here. It says, do students majoring in CS tend to have higher grade point average than students majoring in other subjects? The important thing to know here is that we do not have enough information to make this statement because we have no information about students majoring in other subjects. As we saw above, 
This only has information about students majoring in computer science. Therefore, we cannot infer A. C shows here what percent of students attending college in a certain state are majoring in computer science. Now, the problem here is that it wants to see what percentage of students, and we actually don't have that information because we would need to know which students are majoring in things other than computer science. Or we would need to know just in general how many students there are in total. We don't have that information. We only know information about students that are taking computer science. D is interesting. It says which college has the highest number of students majoring in computer science. The problem here is that we have information about the state in which the student attends college, but we actually don't have any information about the specific colleges. We don't have the names of the colleges. So this one also cannot be the case. Now let's look at B, which is obviously the leftover answer. How many states have a higher percentage of female computer science majors? Even if we don't have the percentage data itself, we can easily compare which one has just more female students than male students in computer science. So we actually have all of this information. We have information about the state, we have information about the gender, and whether they're in computer science here. The answer to this one is B. This is a little tricky. These problems tend to be a lot of kind of just investigative detective work of sorts. Now let's do a problem on the trickier side of things. Here we have a problem which, by the way, contains a little bit more information up at the top. But it turns out we actually don't need any of that information for this one. Instead, what we need is actually just what's in these charts and the descriptions. On the right here, we have the total amount of data stored in gigabytes. And on the left here, we have number of registered users in millions. Now, notice specifically, uh, I kind of misread that, but it's this is in millions of gigabytes, right? So millions of gigabytes. It turns out we actually won't need the information in this pie chart. Uh, this is actually a multi-part question, but we're going to look at the first part. Now the question is going to ask for what this tells us about the average amount of data stored per user for the first eight years of the application's existence. And by the way, that's this whole period up here, right? That's this period and this period. Now this is the classic type of question where there's just no standard way to solve something like this. You have to look at this, really think through the data and use critical thinking and problem solving to come up with a solution. And that seems like a cop out, but actually that's how these questions are designed to be done. Uh, so what we can actually tell first off is you notice that the shape of these graphs is pretty similar. This one seems to kind of go up at the same rate as this one here. And what you also notice is if you look at the numbers pretty closely, the numbers are actually pretty similar. 26, 260, here's 105, here's 1014. It doesn't take a whole lot of introspection to realize that this is basically, each of these numbers is basically 10 times the numbers on the left. So 262 is approximately one tenth of 26, right? Likewise, you take, let's say 2,208, that's basically, that's about one tenth of 202 over here, right? So if that means that 26 million users at this point had about 262 millions of gigabytes, that means that on average, one user has roughly 10 gigabytes in each of these. And that's actually what A suggests right here. Across all eight years, the average amount of data stored per user was about 10 gigabytes. Now, if you're not actually sure like why you would even make this inference, like how do you even know what to look at, work about it backwards. So look at the other, look at all the answers and see whether you can infer any of these from the data. So what we did here was we looked at the data and inferred what A said, but you could look at it the other way. You could look at A and say, does this data actually show us that the average amount of data stored per user was about 10 gigabytes? And that's where you can look at the data and see if you can make the reasoning that we did earlier. Notice, for example, that B is pretty similar, but instead of 10 gigabytes, it's 100 gigabytes. So you, you look at the data and you can see that the data doesn't really show that. It doesn't really show that the number on the left is 100th of the number on the right. Similarly, you look at C and D and they bring up different ideas. They say, for example, that the amount of data stored increases by 10 gigabytes each year. And we actually see that it doesn't increase. It's pretty much static. It's pretty much consistent over the time. The number on the right divided by the number on the left is pretty much 10 every time. Now, here's a wildly different type of problem. This is about actually correlation and causation type of stuff. So uh, what we need to know here is this very important piece of data, which is each X represents a point in the survey where somebody said they were interested in the application and O represents that they were not interested. Now be careful with that, make sure you read it carefully, because normally you would think of X as maybe not being interested and O as being interested, but here it clearly tells us that X means they are interested. Now let's look at the data in the graph itself. It says 
over here on this axis, it says number of hours spent reading per day. And here it says number of hours spent using smartphone per day. And what we see here is that up here, we get a lot more X's for people who tend to read more per day. And the number of time spent on the smartphone doesn't really seem to affect that very much. You notice that there are some people with one here that are not interested and some who are interested. Same down here for five. Some people are not interested and some people are interested. It doesn't really seem to correlate very strongly with this piece of information. Whereas this seems to have a strong correlation, right? You notice that as the number of hours spent reading, you notice a higher tendency towards X and a lower tendency towards O. Just from reading that data, it seems pretty clear that it implies that there is some kind of correlation between the number of hours spent reading and whether or not they are interested in the application. And that's what it says here in A. Participants who read more are more likely to say that they were interested in the application, meaning that the answer here is A. All right, now here's a question that has a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of information, but we actually only care about a very small amount of it. So let's take a look at this. We have a bunch of data about some restaurant, but notice here that it says, a student wants to count the number of restaurants in the spreadsheet whose price range is $30 or less and whose average customer rating is at least 4.0. By the way, notice that it says and right here. So we want to know something that has both of those things. Now notice that it also says suppose price range contains the price range as a string. That's this right here, by the way, that's this column. Average rating is this column right here, average customer rating. So the two pieces of information we're interested in here are price range 30 or less and customer rating is at least 4.0. Now 30 or less can be a couple things. Notice here it says that low is anything under 10 and med is 11 to 30 and high is over 30, which means that low is okay, med is also okay, but high is not okay. So we don't want high and we do want low and we do want med. So basically we want to not have this one here. Now notice that what we're doing here is we're actually writing a filter. This is, what is the code for a filter here for this property? So here we want to make sure we only include things that have low or medium, low or med, and things that have average customer ratings that are greater than or equal to 4.0, right? So that first part right here is average rating greater than or equal to 4.0, and we also wanted to have that price range property. Now remember, that is, it can have either low or med, right? So low is fine, but med is also fine. Notice also that the price range can't possibly be both low and med. That's not a possibility, right? Price range can only have one of those two values. So in other words, we want something that has two properties. The average rating is greater than or equal to 4.0, and it's got a price range either low or med. So that's this one right here, B. Greater than or equal to 4.0 and one of these two, either low or med. All right, to wrap up our discussion on data, we wanna talk a little bit about metadata. Metadata is data about data. So generally extra details. So as it describes here, when a user posts a message in this problem, the message itself is considered data. And in addition to the data, the site stores some metadata as well. Now the metadata includes the time, the name of the user who posted, and the name of users who commented on the message, as well as the times that those comments were made. So the question is asking, when is it useful to analyze the data instead of the metadata? So we're focused on which of these is describing data. So let's see, A says to determine the users who post most frequently. So users who post most frequently is metadata, right? That's this right here, so that's not it. Determine the time of the day the site is most active. So the time at which the message was posted is metadata as well, that's this right here, so it's not B. And D says to determine which post from a particular user receive the greatest number of comments. So again, comments is metadata, it's this down here. So not being A, B, or D, the answer is C, but why is that? C says to determine the topics that many users are posting about. So topic is part of the actual message, right? As we see here, the message itself is considered the data. So topic is not listed as metadata, it's part of the message itself. It would be the actual data. So that would be C. All right, let's wrap up with one more question here. So here's another one about metadata. It says we have a bunch of photos 
and each photo file contains data in the level of red, green, and blue for each pixel for the photo. So that's RGB is the data for the photo. Meanwhile, it also says the file also contains metadata, which describes the date, time, and geographic region where the photo was taken. So this question is asking for two answers of when metadata would be more appropriate than data. So we're looking for which of these would do better with metadata. So the first one is chronological order of the photos. This is definitely metadata. We saw here that the time and date is part of the metadata. B is determine the number of clouds in a particular photo. So the clouds are part of the photo itself, right? That's part of the pixels in RGB here. So that right here would be part of the data. Determine whether a photo is suitable for printing in black and white. So that's also part of the data. You would have to look at the photo and see how those pixels would translate to black and white. And finally, determine the two photos were taken in the same location of different days. So geographic location as well as date and time are also both metadata. So the answers here are A and D.